So we're going to talk today about time and chronology. Uh, I'm going to start again with one of our visits to a place this time. I think this is the first one that we're visiting in the Maritimes. So we're, we're here in Atlantic Canada. Actually, it's hard to see on that. We'll zoom in a little bit more. But this is in Nova Scotia. So this is a site called the DeBert site. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And again, uh, sort of this is a part of a kind of a way of thinking about space. So we're going to talk a little bit about the um, traditional kind of archaeological approach to it and the way in which this site has become very much a Mi'kmaq community place and um, has been a Mi'kmaq community place, but is now a part of a sort of a cultural center and a way of communicating about Mi'kmaq past. So uh, as you can see, we've now moved to the end of the last ice age around 10,000 years ago, 10 to 12,000 years ago. And so this is the archaeological perspective on this. DeBert is one of the one of the oldest intact sites in Canada. And, uh, and so it's uh, very important in its own right, uh, in an archaeological sense. Uh, now, one of the things that is t typical of this time period is uh, the fact that uh, material culture, in particular, the stone tool technologies that we find on these sites are very diagnostic. We talked a little bit about that last class. I showed an image of uh, Fluted Point and talked through some of the technologies. Well, Debert is one of those sites that has produced a number of these Fluted Points. What's really fascinating to archaeologists is that that technology is very widespread. Uh, it occurs all the way from sort of the, at the time there would have been glacial ice still on the, on the land. It occurs all the way from the limits of glacial ice in the north, north all the way down into South America. And so, although I think from a non-archaeological perspective, one can see quite a bit of variability, from an archaeological perspective, these are all quite homogenous, even though they occur all over, from all over the place, everywhere from Virginia to Texas to Alberta to South America, Iowa. Um, the characteristics that we archaeologists see as being very um, diagnostic of this period is, as I said, this, this long removal from the base that makes this kind of flute. Uh, and, and we can see that that's, and this sort of concave base, that's, that's a very um, characteristic way of making tools in this period that's very different from subsequent periods. And so there have been a lot, there's been a lot, this is an area of a lot of research. People do a lot of, uh, this is research that attracts a lot of archaeological interest. And so even though it's a period actually where the archaeological record is really problematic, there's poor preservation, there's challenges with radiometric dating, and all sorts of things, the fact that it's one of the oldest, or the oldest archaeologically known, attracts a lot of attention. It's also the case that this was at a time when there were um, megafauna, large Pleistocene animals still on the landscape. And so there's a very um, powerful way in which we can consider how people living at this time were interacting with those uh, animals. And so what you see here, this is a map of North America. The yellow spots are, are actually projectile point finds. So they're finds of um, this kind of classic fluted point. Uh, and the, the size of the dot indicates the numbers that have been found. And so you can see that they're found from all over North America. One of the things that's important to note, and there are researchers who have pointed this out, these distributions, don't, they, it, it's easy to read this and say, this is where these people were, or people who made fluted points were in. This is the distribution of those, the people who made those fluted points. But in actual fact, it's often the distribution of the archaeologists who look for those fluted points that we're seeing mapped here. So there is a real strong correlation with urban centers and places where there's a lot of archaeological research, a lot of development that's recovering these, and then less in, in less populated areas. Um, but So it's hard to tell which, which of these things is causing this patterning. But the, the take home for us is they're all over North America. And in fact, they are also found in parts of South America. Um, and so, and this actually is also a nice image because it really gets at what I was talking about, about glacial ice. Uh, so we had large continental um, glaciers still on the landscape 
at a time when these people were coming into the area, and um, there's lots of research that focus on what was happening at the end of, end of the Ice Age. It didn't just proceed with the way, you know, in a big picture way, the way winter ends, where everything melts and it's all good. It was fits and starts actually the way winter actually is. You know, sometime around St. Patrick's Day, you think, this is great, spring, it's wonderful, and then boom, we get another huge snowstorm. Well, that's the way the last end of the last ice age went. Everything was going along swimmingly, and then we had a period called the Younger Dryas where things got cold again, glaciers began to expand. And so people were living here through those uh, very challenging, and in those very challenging environments in a time when there was a lot of uh, uh, dynamic stuff happening with the environment. Uh, the issue of um, the excitement around fluted points and this period goes back a long time in archaeology. This is a very famous find, which I'll talk about when I will get back to this when we talk about radiocarbon dating. Uh, but this is an example of uh, direct association between uh, uh, extinct bison, bison bison antiquus, and fluted points that was in Folsom, New Mexico. And so this was when we started to really realize that, there, that these points had considerable antiquity. This was the subject of a lot of debate, and it's therefore not surprising that this was one of the first uh, radiocarbon dates that were run once that technique was developed in the 1950s. But this is a good illustration of the importance of association and context and the relationship between artifacts and objects as a part of uh, dating things. So um, this, in the in archaeological uh, sort of standard archaeological approaches, the Paleo-Indian phenomena and the fluted point phenomena, the fluted point phenomena in particular, but the, the larger period often being referred to as Paleo-American or Paleo-Indian, uh, extending from you know older than 12,000 years ago up to about 9,500 years ago, or roughly, uh, depending on the region and uh, local chronologies and that sort of thing. A big issue there that uh, is about the peopling of the Americas. Those, those two things are often tied in archaeological narratives. So this has to do with how, what, whether this was the first culture in the Americas uh, and, and what that means for how North America was settled. This is an area of contention with indigenous communities, which I'll get back to um, when, I, when I talk more about Dubert, uh, because there are many traditional stories about where people came from that are in conflict with um, archaeological narratives on this point. It is also the case that archaeologists' notions of first, is, it's a moving target. We don't really ever find the oldest. We make arguments about what's oldest at the moment when we find it, but there's always the possibility of older things, and there's a lot of debates about whether this was uh, originally conceived of as the primary way in which the Americas, people moved into the Americas. We're now getting all sorts of genetic information that's challenging these ideas, and really uh, indicating that this process is a lot more complicated, that there is probably greater antiquity to people in the Americas than sort of the older archaeological narratives have suggested, and that this is probably only one way in which people could be could have been moving um, at the time. The the sort of basic logic of so Clovis first, being that being fluted points, Clovis and fluted points are not exactly the same thing, but well, it has been used in that way. Um, Clovis being that sort of archaeological culture that's typified by fluted points. Um, fluted point, that one of the reasons why this even became a concept is because of that distribution of those appearing in a relatively short period of time over such a large area. It really does have that appearance of a, a sort of a movement in of a people and a sort of spreading out across the landscape in a fairly rapid way. But having said that, there is lots of ways in which now we're understanding that there were multiple routes that people could have used to travel into the Americas, that people could have also traveled out of the Americas at the same time. Uh, and there's genetic evidence to show that uh, there wasn't just one population that kind of just moved in and settled the area. And then, of course, there is the, the traditional knowledge and the uh, other ways of understanding this period that um, often exist in contention with archaeological perspectives. 
So now to get back to DeBert, so we're going to zoom in. You can see where it is in Nova Scotia. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of this site. In 1948, uh, private collector Dennis, uh, W.A. Dennis of Kentville, purchased a small collection of artifacts from a Department of National Defense property. It's basically a crypto-crystalline uh, material that is occurring in the basalts of the area or at the interface of basalts with other rocks that is really glassy, really attractive. It's often bright colors, reds, yellows, whites. It's often variegated, so it'll have patterning in it like moss agates do. Um, and so that's the material that uh, a lot of these artifacts are made from. And you can see, I'll show you an example. These, this, for example, this semi-translucent material here, this is, I mean, I'm looking at it in a really terrible picture, but I suspect that's what these are, are this minus, this minus basin uh, chert, to use the archaeological way of describing it. That make sense? So it comes from nearby, but not right at the site. And you can see how um, we're trying to sort of place, I keep losing my mouse here, divert into this sort of larger framework of a number of similar sites in the Northeast. These are different sites that occur uh, in uh, parts of New England and uh, Quebec. Um, and so uh, looking at these in, in very much in a way of trying to sort out the larger region this diagram here, we'll talk about when we get to radiocarbon dating. This is a diagram that shows um, uh, radiometric dates. So what we call C14 dates. And there's different sites that are being reported here. Time is along this axis, so 14,000, 13,000, 12,000. Uh, so moving in this direction towards present. These dots represent dates, and you'll see that there's these lines through them. Those are because the dates are statistical estimates. So that's the range, uh, a range representing the most probable age. So the darker numbers are probably one standard deviation, and you see that there's very pale lines that extend. That's probably uh, two standard deviations. So that would give you 95% confidence going out to 2%. Uh, or uh, two standard deviations. We'll talk about this when we talk about radiocarbon dates. But that's the way in which we tend to read them. So it means that the date is 95% likely to be somewhere along that line. It doesn't mean that it's at this point. It just means that it's somewhere in there in a statistical way. It's still 5% likely to be actually outside that. Uh, but when you see them aggregated like this, you start to, uh, particularly if you're making assumptions about them reflecting a fairly limited period of activity, you start to narrow down the likely age of a particular site. And so what you're seeing here is that there are sites that are um, at the, actually in the sort of what we would consider the Pleistocene, the sort of period of the Pleistocene proper, but then there is a long period during this period when it got colder again, the Younger Dryas, where a lot of these sites are falling. So this is people living in a landscape where Glaciers are actually re-advancing in some areas. It's getting colder. There are some areas that actually had been habitable prior to the younger grass that become less habitable. So the birth's very interesting because it is falling right in that period. So despite the fact that this is a federally designated site, the site actually is located in traditional unceded Mi'kmaq territory, um, but also uh, in in provincial, in, in the provincial lands and sort of the modern jurisdictional sense. Mi'kmaq people regard many of the na uh, federal and provincial designations as claims on the site. Uh, and I should say that no Mi'kmaq people were involved in the original excavation in the 1960s. In recent years, the site has become threatened by ATV use, industrial developments and dumping, and the Mi'kmaq nation moved to become more actively involved in the management of the site forming uh, a group called Mi'kmaqi de Bert, uh, uh, as a part of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq uh, involvement in the, the area. Mi'kmaqi de Bert is a vision for a culture center guided by elder principles, and this is a quote, where the sites are protected, understood, and honored by the nation, all levels of government, academia, and the general public. 
the key message of Mi'kma'i de Bert is one of dissent. And this is the our sort of um, thing to muse on. This is where we move away from sort of the conventional archaeological perspective to sort of think about the implications for how we've structured knowledge about de Bert and about this period and think about it a little bit more broadly. So one of the ways in which archaeologists, what archaeologists have done is focused on this antiquity, the difference, how this was an unusual kind of environment, a place that was different from now. All of these are mechanisms that really separate that place and what people were doing there from the present. The Nigma approach has been very different to that approach. It has been one of really uh, understanding the connections that are there between the present and the distant past. And part of this reflects different understandings of time and, and how we measure it and conceive of it as something separate from us or as something that we're a part of in a, in a sort of a complex way. Uh, and I'm going to read to you a line from um, an article that was written in 2008 in Archaeologies of Placemaking, which was a book. And it's written by, the, this quote comes from Excuse me, Julian Bernard and Leah Rose, Julian Bernard and, Le and Rosenmeyer. And this is the quote: "If there is one shared sentiment across McMaki, it's that people share a homeland. We come from this place. This statement does not mean that people have been exactly the same for 11,000 years. It does not mean that there has been no linguistic, cultural, or biological change amongst people who have lived in McMaki since." the last glaciation. It simply means that relative to other groups of people who live in North America, Mi'kmaq and First Nations people descend from this place in a way no other group of people do. And I, and I find this to be a really kind of exciting and nuanced understanding of place. And so when we've talked about heritage places and our connection to them, this is a very sophisticated notion of place. But it's not all that different and I think this is where, when you start to look at things comparatively, it's not all that different about placemaking in other parts of the world. And I think this is where, in North America, people tend to think of place in a way that is, even when they don't necessarily understand treaties or what unceded territory means, is mediated by this environment. And so the way to expose this is to think about, well, how do we think about these places elsewhere? So let's go to another example. This is an example of a place. This is Hadrian's Wall. So this is much, much more recent than de Bert. This is from the Roman period in Great Britain. It's an uh, area between Scotland and what is now England. And uh, it's, um, so it was built by the Romans to keep the Picts out. Uh, this was a time when there was a lot of dynamic stuff happening. We have a relatively spotty historic account of what was happening. So there's a lot of discussion about how the various groups that were identified in those historic records relate to, um, for example, being Roman, the descended population, modern Scots, how are they connected to Picts and Celts and so on and so forth. Um, uh, they're a group identified in the historical stuff at the time. Uh, and so, P-I-C-T. Um, so this, the, 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 the issue here is, well, whose place is this? Well, oh, geez, if the Romans built it, isn't it Italian? Would we ever make that argument? <laughs> Would we ever say that Hadrian's Wall is not British, a British site? <laughs> because, and I think dissent is a part of this, this, this broader notion of dissent that these people who are here now, the British, <laughs> this is on their territory. It is a part of their heritage in complicated ways. That it doesn't mean that people were speaking the same language. It doesn't, we don't hold Hadrian's Wall to the same standard that we would the relationship between de Bert and contemporary Mi'kmaq. We, there is a sort of a way in which you say, oh, well, that can't be Mi'kmaq because they wouldn't have been Mi'kmaq people 13,000 years ago. Well, there weren't Scottish and English people 2,000 years ago, but we don't seem to have this problem with considering this British. So I think there's a way in which 
we do have particular notions, again, we've been playing around with this idea of descent, ethnicity, culture, identity, and place. And so I think I, I personally find what's happened at Debert with the Mi'kma'wi Debert to be very exciting because it really does open up all of those little boxes that we would use to think about these kinds of things. So any questions about Debert or those issues? That's our thought for the day. <laughs> um, Okay, so we have another 10 minutes. I'm gonna talk about time and dating. Time and dating. And I don't mean this kind of dating. <laughs> this is my joke. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, when I first was hired here, I was asked to give a talk about my research. And so I, I've constructed this as a part of it. And I came to the, to the university, it was a public lecture. And I get up there and I'm talking about radiocarbon dating and statistical analysis. And in order to understand radiocarbon dating, you have to talk a little bit about particle physics. And I look at the audience and the first row is like physics, physicist, physicist, statistician, statistician, physicist. And I'm like, you know, mother, <laughs> this is going to be really painful because, I mean, I, I have enough understanding to use the data, but I'm definitely not a physicist or a statistician. So uh, this is my attempt to kind of break the ice with this crowd. So, we want to talk a little bit about this uh, issue of dating in archaeology to be able to get to talking about radiometric dating. I would argue that radiometric dating is one of the transformative things that has happened in the 20th century in archaeology. It has, it's, it's a technique and a technology, but it has radically changed the way we think about time, the way we measure it, the way we do archaeological work, our methods, our field methods, all sorts of things. So in order to understand this, we have to understand what did radiocarbon dating supplement or what, what, how did we date things in the archaeological sense before uh, we, did re we had radiometric dating. And so we use something called relative dating, and I don't mean this kind of relative dating. There's so many dating jokes you can make. I have a good one on my door, which is about carbon dating and it shows a person at a table having a glass of wine with a lump of charcoal. Um, so it's not that. Uh, relative dating is determination of chronological sequence without reference to a fixed time scale such as a calendar. So basically when you do relative dating in archaeology you are saying something is relatively older than something else or younger than something else. And when you think about how Stratigraphy works in a site. We make an, an assumption that something in a layer, all the things in one layer are the same age. Therefore, things that are in deeper layers are older and things that are in more shallow layers are younger. That's a, those are relative dating statements. And so this is exactly that approach. You have uh, sequence, you have different layers, you have artifacts coming out of those layers, and you can say, well, because this particular point, here we have our fluted point right down at the bottom, is from the deepest layer, it is relatively older than stuff that's from higher up. It's a pretty straightforward and basic concept, and one that we've really relied on in terms of sorting out the chronology of the past. Obviously, there are problems and challenges that this technique has. And I have to say that if you look at archaeological techniques in the first half of the 20th century, a lot of them were focused on this problem of sorting out chronology using relative dating. One of the problems is correlation. We have uh, layers um, over here and layers over here. We can make assumptions that they are continuous, but we don't know that. And so when we don't have continuous layers, we can have a challenge figuring out how old something is relative to something else. That's particularly the case when those, and this is not just a problem for archaeology, but any discipline that uses stratigraphy as a, um, as a way of sorting out chronology. If you look at this uh, geological example, we have, uh, we have discontinuous deposits. What we're trying to do here is make correlations based on their contents. So when you have one kind of fossil in one layer 
in a similar kind of fossil in another layer, even if the content, other content of that layer, or the matrix, or the rock, or whatever, is different, we can make we can make assumptions about similar age. So this whole notion that we talked about last class about the type, uh, the index fossil, and, and how it can be used to to um, do identify, uh, be assigned to a chron chronological sequence is critical for this kind of relative dating because you can actually, if you get in your head that all fluted points are from a certain period of time, when you find a fluted point, you can then make a correlation. So you're building up this really complex model that has a lot of theoretical implications. We talked a little bit about what we think that patterning might mean. You can see how we're dancing around these issues and we'll come back to them. But what that, that could mean. In other cases, this one sort of suggests that you've got two sequences that are somewhat similar, but there's depositional environments. We talked about how some environments have a lot of deposits building up over time where others don't. This, uh, this is from a site that, that we worked on uh, up in uh, Metapanagia. Uh, and this is one, uh, another site in Metapanagia that was excavated uh, earlier. They are from two different depositional environments. This one's down in the floodplain where lots of silt and sand gets brought in. This is way up on the top of the terrace where no silt and sand gets brought in. Both of them have, uh, uh, both of them, uh, the deepest part of them appear to be about uh, 25 to 3,000 years ago. They both accumulated over that period of time, but you can see that they they have very different depositional events. So how can how can we make correlations between these? This is potentially a palimpsest, as we talked about. Potentially a place where very long, st stable land surface where people lived repeatedly over a long period of time, not giving, not allowing there to be, well, not having any separation occurring between those activities in terms of deposits. So they all look like the same period. Whereas this one, lots of regular flooding, lots of uh, buildup of soil and so on. So we have had, we, based on radiometric dating, we can now determine that both represent roughly 3,000 years of deposition. But without radiocarbon dating, you wouldn't know that. So because you might know that something is older or younger than something else, but you don't know what, how, what is the start or the first, the old, what is the date of those things. So how did they figure to be first So this is gonna be probably our story of next class. This is what we, this is radiocarbon dating. This is how we, because we didn't know. I mean, there was this, when I was a kid, my grandfather, uh, I was doing archeological research and my mother's Kid, but a young teenager person. I was talking about teenager person as like an alien. Uh, I was talking about the things I was learning about chronology and the thousands of years ago. And my grandfather said, "Oh, well, we know that that there weren't people here more than a couple hundred years ago before contact." And that's because they didn't have a start date. And that was a widely held view in the early part of the 20th century. It also has a lot of implications for making people less, it, it erodes claims to land when you make those statements. Um, and so there's a lot of implications of that. But that's, it was the, the, the things that, one of the first things we dated was that Folsom point in association with a bison, anti, uh, an extinct bison. Because that was a question, that was, it was a huge question. How old are they? So I'm gonna explain how that technique works next class. Actually, 20 after. So, just getting into the good stuff. <laughs> Okay, so we'll pick up with uh, uh, good stuff from my point of view because I love radiocarbon dating, but uh, we'll pick up with talking about Folsom and that first radiocarbon date next class. And thanks for your patience with uh, the technology today. <laughs> yeah.